Health's Laboratory Safety Officer. Uh, my beginnings were pretty humble in this role. I started as a material processor when I was 19 at Kent State in Ohio, and I've worked pretty much in every capacity for hazardous materials, from a material processor, like a grunt at a facility, learning the ropes, to enforcement, to even an unexploded ordinance project in Maui, Hawaii. I moved here about 18 years ago. I was the hazardous materials specialist at the town of Barnstable, and I'm going to tie in a lot of things for you tonight to this particular law of EPGRA in an environmental and aquifer protection format. Normally when I talk about this, this is predominantly an emergency preparedness law, but to give you some empowerment and some information to foster relationships in your town, this is a great law that I think little is known about the sections of this law that can really help a Board of Health understand what is in a facility in terms of hazardous materials. So it's EPGRA I'll be talking about, and I'm gonna be using a lot of acronyms. That's just kind of the world of emergency preparedness. I'll emphasize the acronyms, and if you need you know, to understand one, just, just stop me. But EPGRA is Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Act. And I'm gonna explain how we use this law, or you can too, for hazardous chemical facility assessments, safety assessments, reporting, which is done annually to me by facilities across the Cape and Nantucket, and preparedness. So just to back up, do I think, I don't know if the people are aware, the public is aware, Judy Giorgio is our chairwoman for our Cape and Islands Health Agents Coalition, and I facilitate that coalition. So we've worked for years on all aspects of public health emergency preparedness. A lot of this information is, is pretty relevant to that as well. But my goal is to show you a proactive use of the federal law of EPGRA. Um, EPGRA is synonymous with Sarah Title III, that's its federal reference. You can use this law in a town for understanding hazardous materials uh, by collaborating with us at the Barnstable County Regional Emergency Planning Committee, which many facilities and town fire departments do, local emergency management does, and public and private facilities are who we're talking about. So whether you're a town facility or you're a private facility, um, you have to comply with this law. You have to report your annual inventories and other details, which I'll explain in a bit. We can uh, use this law to educate facilities, and I am very big on education and working with a facility. I've been doing this you know, for many years, 30 years, so I'm not green. This law is not enforcement. That's important to point out to all of you. This is compliance assistance. That's the world I live in. That's the world I would bring someone from public health in, so it's compliance assistance. Uh, my goal is to basically have uh, a compliant facility that is empowered um, in the town as a hazmat facility, compliant, prepared, and is able to not only, you know, fall in line with this law, and, and but also to uh, be better a better steward for protecting the environment and our sole source aquifer. So, what is EPGRA? In a nutshell, we could do a whole separate presentation on this. Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Act. Well, the first thing I'll tell you is if you're ever lacking sleep, download the full legal version of this law and you'll be asleep in three minutes because it is the most uh, expanded law with lots of legal jargon that has resulted from years and years since it was incept, incep, its inception in 86, 1986, by lawyers that were fighting it for these lawyers representing facilities because they didn't want to divulge uh, a lot of trademark information that they felt was very pertinent to manufacturing in terms of hazardous chemicals. So it is a very long, um, it's cumbersome to read. I actually don't mind it. I'm kind of a um, you know, a great nerd in that way, I don't mind. So basically, EPGRA is based on a chemical release that happened in Bhopal, India in the mid 80s. And I will tell you in a nutshell that everything that could have gone wrong in that gas, chemical gas release at that plant in Bhopal, India went wrong. From poor planning to the terrible response to the public not knowing what chemicals were at the facility, 
to the facility owners lying, to the even the death count was falsified. It was supposedly between three to five thousand. Many reports are it was more along the lines of twenty thousand. It decimated a community in Bhopal, India. So what did the United States do when that happened in in the eighties? They learned from that and said we'd like to implement a law where we can gather information and understand what kind of hazardous chemicals are in our facilities, and we can use that information to enhance our emergency planning for these types of emergencies. So we identify facilities through EPCRA that use and store, and I'm talking large quantities, everybody. I'm not talking about a can of WD-40 or some motor oil. We're talking thousands of gallons of chemicals and also um, extremely hazardous substances. You see that second bullet. We're outlining the transportation routes of extremely hazardous substances going to a facility and leaving a facility. So you have a transporter that might come on Cape, maybe they deliver anhydrous ammonia to a skating rink. That is documented in a reporting process under EPCRA. It also describes emergency response plans and procedures at the facility and offsite. It designates a facility emergency coordinator. So there has to be an emergency contact and there has to be an emergency coordinator. This is 24 hours. It's also documented in this report. And I will show you, um, not, not the, we won't have time to get into the full report, but I'll give you a summary of Chatham's reports at the end of this presentation so you have an idea who's reporting in your town so it all kind of comes together for you. The, also, we have to establish a facility emergency release notification procedure. That's kind of EPCRA in a nutshell, really. So when I work for the Barnstable County Regional Emergency Planning Committee in one of the many hats that I wear, what's our role with EPCRA? Uh, we have basically two responsibilities at the REPC. We have to form a partnership with local governments and industries. We are the resource for enhancing this whole hazardous materials reporting and training and um, planning process. We also are responsible for the integration of hazmat planning and response within our jurisdiction. So think of, look at the whole Commonwealth in your head and there's, there's, emergency planning districts that are mapped out across the state. The one that Chatham participates in is Barnstable County Regional Emergency Planning. Most towns have an LEPC and, and some on the Cape still do, but most of our towns or pretty much, I should say all our towns and Nantucket have an agreement that we are a kind of a unified command. We are a regional emergency planning committee. So that's why, where I come in, in a non-enforcement role. So this is the backbone to the REPC. When LEPCs were established, they were based on EPCRA. It was all hazmat many years ago. Since 9-11, we have morphed and changed into what we call all hazards. So when you hear that term, all hazards, we now address weather related, we address uh, terrorism, things of that nature. So when I, that's when we say EPCRA is the backbone to the REPC planning requirements, so. Um, I'm getting, there's some background noise. If someone can help me mute that, I would, that, I would appreciate that. It's, it's, a little, it's a little distracting to hear that. So thank you, if that can be done. Um, so the backbone, what does that mean in the planning requirements? We're providing data that can determine um, areas and populations that are potentially affected by releases and spills. Uh, that, could, that population could be a school. It could be a nursing home. Um, it, it, this planning, this documentation that is done through EPCRA, it enables mapping programs for emergency responders and employees and other agencies. So when I'm talking about the reporting, it's one report from a facility that has large quantities of chemicals. It's done once a year by March 1st. That's the EPA federal deadline. They have to submit that report to me, the Chatham Fire Department, and Mass Emergency Management Agency. And then all that data goes to the EPA for oversight and enforcement. But we also obviously use that data, and this is that laundry list that I'm giving you. We facilitate mandatory trainings and exercise methods for regional emergency response plans. That's, that's we have to do that. So we actually co coordinate usually with the Mass Maritime Academy and their emergency preparedness program to do that. And then we have to provide facility evacuation plans as well. If you look at that picture on the right, uh, one of our municipal members of this 
EPGRA of Tier 2 and of the Emergency Planning Committee is Hyannis Water System, and they have four compliant facilities. But that picture shows you that back in 2009, they had a potassium hydroxide release. So they get potassium hydroxide in a pelletized uh, fashion. They mix it with water. And back at that time, it was released into the road. Now, you can imagine when we talk about contamination, environmental degradation, aquifers being affected, that right there is what I'm talking about. These things do happen on Cape Cod. So the evolution of my program, the EPGRA compliance program, or what we call Tier 2, it started in 2004 when I started at the county. I had 56 facilities reporting, and now I oversee roughly 460. Um, you know, people take chemical, they eliminate chemicals, things change, people retire. It's it, it's a mishmash, but it's usually 460 facilities that are reporting to me from January 1st to March 1st of every year. 175 of these on Cape Cod and Nantucket have one or more extremely hazardous substance. It's usually, the Cape doesn't have a lot of industry, so it's usually sulfuric acid, anhydrous ammonia, or chlorine, something to, to that effect. I do a lot of outreach, education, lots of relationship building with any and all hazmat facilities. And my program, I'm proud to say, is really served as a model for other places in the Commonwealth. And you can see in that picture, I had the South Korean Environmental Council come to see me in 2016 and 2017 to learn about my program. They were referred to me from the EPA in Region 1 Boston, and they made the trip to the Cape to learn about my program, and they're replicating it in South Korea. I'm, I'm really proud of that, and they're, they're lovely. They stay in touch all the time, and that was a real honor for me to have that program be replicated. Uh, so what does EPRA compliance do? I'm going to cover a few benefits here. And I want you to think as I'm talking about these, I know that, again, this topic is dominant in the EPREP world, but it's all connected, right? It's connected to our environmental protection. So EPCRA compliance from a facility empowers emergency preparedness at facilities in your towns. And these reports provide what we can see, what chemicals are, are in your town, what are the quantities. These reports, you see if you see the acronym for EPCRA, Emergency Planning, Community Right to Know, everyone sitting on this Board of Health today has the right to know what's in those reports. You can contact me at any time. We can go through the database. We can look at your facilities in your towns and, and who's reporting and who's not. And there's always a facility that I'm, I'm unaware of. I'm always learning about a new facility. But this is just what's in there in a, in a nutshell. What are the chemicals? Where are they? How are they stored? Did the facility acquire a new chemical? Were there any changes? Did they retire a chemical or eliminate a chemical? These reports reflect this every year because they're updated and submitted to me. ECRA lowers risk in your town. Pre-planning data comes from these reports that are filed with me under EPGRA. So these help this that helps the responders, yes? So they form an IAP. What's an IAP? An incident action plan. Quickly, efficiently, these reports give data for that. There's maps in there, site plans, all kinds of contact information, chemical quantities, and so on. Um, it helps the first responder also understand chemical incompatibility. It helps the worker understand that too. So if a facility stores a lot of diesel fuel, uh, you would, through an assessment or through the tier two process, you would discourage storing um, any kind of oxidizer near diesel because that would encourage combustion. You wouldn't put water on a sulfuric acid fire. That's what I mean by chemical incompatibility, and this empowers that kind of communication and education. It prevents injury, permanent disability of a responder, a worker uh, from a chemical exposure, prevents death. Um, it mitigates environmental contamination, very important when we think about that photo of Hyannis water. When we think about California right now, um, I believe it's Huntington Beach that's getting hit hard with that oil spill. Uh, these things happen, right? And it's that I bring that up because a lot of our reporting facilities, including in Chatham, are boat yards and yacht yards and they're on the water. Okay. EPGRA compliance in my program lowers risk for your local businesses, your facilities, whether they're town facilities or private, and your residents. Using the data to pre plan, 
gives us the ability to do a site visit. So let's say after this presentation today, you talk to Judy and you say, we're wondering about um, ABC Boatyard. Have they been asked if or educated on the tier two process. So whether it's me or in collaboration with Judy and the fire department, I can go and I can talk to that facility and educate them on basic hazmat, uh, safety, and, and all the things that I'm, I'm continuing to talk about here. But we also can um, just do that collaboration and find out should they even be doing this process. And if they do, look at all the ways that we're doing prevention um, and if we look at that bottom bullet right there, we can prevent the destruction of a local environment. We can prevent aquifer contamination, and we'll go up from there. We can prevent destruction of surrounding facilities and homes. We can prevent the destruction or elimination of a business. We can protect our residents. We can protect our facility workers. So many, many benefits there for lowering risk. We're improving partnerships under this program. This is a big thing to me. Like I said, I'm not green. Um, I like to have a relationship and a rapport with my facilities. Many of my filers actually are good friends at this point. I think we spend more time talking story when people come to see me for reporting and even remotely than we do doing during the report. I usually budget 30 minutes to catch up with everybody because I've had the pleasure and the privilege of getting to know everyone over the years. And this leads to other environmental education, interactions, um, referrals, questions throughout the year, and I'm happy to serve in that role. But when I mean partnerships, I'm providing um, accurate data to your town. Uh, it's mandatory. They have to give me accurate data to avoid federal enforcement fees, legal expenses, and criminal charges from the EPA. But that accurate data helps our first responders. It informs facilities um, about the annual regulatory update that streamlines the process. What I mean by this is I have a good report with the EPA. I know what's coming down the pike for the next reporting year. I have workshops and I educate the reporters on this. They know what's in store for them and what they need to plan for. And then that makes the reporting process easier by having that relationship with the EPA, Region 1 Boston. It also uh, improves a partnership because there's a communication with what your local fire department wants in the data. So let's say your fire chief in Chatham wants a certain detail added to a site plan or a certain kind of piece of information about the chemicals listed in his town's reports. The law allows me to glean that information in the reporting process. Let's say the Board of Health has a question about something. Is this in the is this in the site plan? Can we collaborate with the Chatham facilities and for the emergency planning purposes for public health? Can we have that piece of information? I can get that for you because there's six sections of this law, which I'm going to show you, that allow us to do that, to work together to improve our environmental protection through this process. Um, it also encourages collaboration. It's really positive public relations between myself, the towns and the facilities and the public to continue this process in the name of emergency preparedness, worker protection and environmental preservation. These are two great examples of facility partnerships that I've had for many years. Uh, United States Coast Guard sector Southeast New England down in Woods Hole, they're wonderful. I do facility site visits down there, and that's more of a mutual education experience. They are so advanced in their environmental protection um, and education. I learn about a military installation. I learn about his regulatory strategies and compliance, and they're very big on sustainability. So that's a really rewarding educational experience for me. I also have a really great relationship with Madiket Marine on Nantucket. They host my annual uh, Tier 2 facility uh, office visits. So I set up in a meeting room at their facility, and I basically am able to help all the Tier 2 filers on Nantucket come there and get their reports done. We do workshops over there, and we also collaborate with um, – Madiket Marine for a facility emergency response drill every year, which is really neat for me to go over there and see what they do. And we do a little question and answer afterwards. So those are two good examples of facility uh, partnerships that have lasted over the years. The compliance in this program also lowers costs for your facilities. Be, through my program, through a site assessment, through a reporting assistance process, 
I'm saving your facilities, whether it's town facility or it's private, 100 to $500 a pop in consultant fees or reporting process, a site visit, something of that nature. This is reducing town and business potential liability. This is in terms of any kind of potential fines, citations, legal action, environmental damage, EPA enforcement, because I am always communicating with the facility, educating, doing the workshops every year. It's just an ongoing process. If there's any news, that gets distributed out to my reporters as well. And then finally, we have the no-cost mandatory hazardous chemical trainings. We have to, in our hazmat plan, which we're mandated to have, uh, we have to drill on a facility every year. So we pick a tier two facility. We collaborate sometimes with Mass Maritime, sometimes with just other entities, and everybody gets together. It's a huge turnout. We focus a hazmat incident on a tier two facility. I believe we did a, a boatyard in Chatham years and years ago. I, I think we did. It's been ages. But we focus on a different town every year, and then we have that training. So very beneficial in terms of um, saving costs for the facilities. These are the six sections that I want you to note um, in, you know, in the slides, and then you can certainly have a copy of these slides. I always tell the facilities, um, especially when it's big corporations and they're like, well, we don't want to do a site plan or we, we shouldn't have to do this or that. Or I sometimes I've gotten some pushback from a, a corporate environmental office and I'll send them this and I'll say, here are six sections of the EPCRA law that allow me to visit your facility, to ask for information, to ask for chemical data. And I want you to know that as a board of health, when we talk about, again, public health emergency planning and we talk about chemical safety, this is relative that we can use these six sections and we can do a site visit and we can educate, work with the facility, work with the fire department. And I don't think there's any better collaboration than to be in good standing with your fire department in terms of emergency preparedness and hazmat. Um, they're not there to shake you down. They're not there to put you out of business. They're there to pre-plan and protect their personnel. And that motivation, among all these other reasons, worker safety, sustaining the business, sustaining the environment, this is all connected, you see. So these six sections really back you up. If you don't have a town ordinance, here you are. You have a federal law. Um, interesting to note when I said I was hazardous materials specialist at the town of Barnstable, this law, EPCRA, and this type of process is what I did. The town adopted the EPCRA law. They just put it into their own words and their ordinance. You, you, when you adopt a law, obviously, it can't be more lenient. It has to be more strict. So I basically was enforcing EPCRA in the town of Barnes, but doing hundreds of inspections of facilities based on the same law, on the same regulatory statute. So what are these facility assessments, these safety site visits do. It's empowering. We're empowering hazmat pre-planning and environmental protection, and we're preventing chemical accidents at an EPCR facility. We're preventing pervasive liabilities for your town. These are two examples. You remember my earlier slide, Hyannis Water System? There it is again, and they took their, that's their headquarters, and they implemented from soup to nuts in the best safety way possible, the engineering of a safe water treatment plant, brand spanking new last year in 2020. And I was able to go there for another facility assessment and to become educated on the newest water treatment plant and what it's all about and all the safety features and emergency features and environmental protection features. The other one I want to mention down below, they're brilliant, is Oyster Harbors in Osterville. They've allowed me to use their facility, which is pristine in terms of environmental protection and safety and hazmat pre-planning. And I have trained the last five hazmat specialists in the town of Barnstable at that facility. And their dock master, they're just, they're great, stellar. No, there's, I can't think of a better private example outside of the military that does such a good job. So very empowering, these, these assessments are. Does uh, chemical, do chemical accidents um, that are catastrophic, do they happen here on Cape Cod? And, you know, you bet. You bet, right? We had the rollover on Route 6 a few years ago. I don't know if anybody remembers that. We had the Bourne Rotary uh, tanker spill a couple years ago. And here's one that was extremely expensive, over $3 million in damages. This was Crosby Yacht Yard in Osterville. This was a five-alarm fire in 2003. What's important for a Board of Health person to note here? That 
Cape Cod and Nantucket marinas and boatyards report a tremendous amount of diesel and gasoline and sulfuric acid battery storage. Winter comes, the boats, mostly, almost every boatyard keeps the fuel in the boat. They rack the boats, this, you know, two to three levels high, and sometimes you can have up to 250 boats or more in one tightly compacted facility. Think about trying to get apparatus in there and think about what you're up against as a responder. Uh, that's a perfect storm, a fiberglass boat full of fuel and then sulfuric acid battery charging room in the middle of the boatyard. Then think about the environmental damage that comes from that. The program that I do educates about this constantly. We, we, we you know, we, through the site visits, through great examples like o Oyster Harbors, through all this connection, through all this you know, reputation building over 17 years, safety and environmental protection work hand in hand, and we try to avoid future incidences like this. So my last two slides, um, I, and I'm sorry, they're they're kind of small. It's kind of hard to see. Again, if you if you want to go over this one-on-one uh, -on -one remotely at, at any time, I, I'm happy to do that. But um, these are the there's. I just did a kind of a um, a screenshot of your facilities, and my image here is very small, so I I can't really uh, make those out. But I have I was able to at least glean two pages for you. There's a third page too, but it's pretty straightforward. You have town facilities. You have like you know Riders Cove. You have you know boatyards and things. This is pretty standard for Cape Cod. Like I said, we don't have a lot of industry here, a lot of factories, things like that. So um, these, this is a typical EPCRA compliant list. It also lists who has an extremely hazardous substance. It shows us when they reported. So I can walk through that with anybody at a separate time and go into more detail about that. And then that's my contact information for all of you. Um, you know, and thank you for having me to explain the program and how it's relevant to you. And I'll just open it up um, to questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Amy. That was fascinating. I've got a question. Um, how much product has to be present at a facility for it to be covered by this law? 10,000 pounds is the threshold. Extremely hazardous substances, it depends on the substance, like fluorine, it's nine gallons. So it just depends. It depends on the chemical. It depends on how the EPA has classified it. And let's just say that there is something called another resource, everybody, if you can't sleep, write down the EPA's list of lists. It is a list of all the chemicals that are and how they're regulated under each federal law. And there are over 500,000 alone just for EPRA Tier 2. So it really is a case by case. But I would tell you that, again, what are the heavy hitters on Cape Cod? Gasoline, diesel, which are not extremely hazardous, and sulfuric acid. And sulfuric acid's threshold is if you have 500 pounds or more, it has to be reported. And then we do the conversions to gallons with the facilities. So, so what what I'm wondering in my brain about is um, the fact that it would not require that many gallons of a hazardous substance to be uh, spilled on a sandy spot in Chatham to really potentially uh, damage the aquifer. It, it, it depends. It, it's always, it's kind of like when we're in the lab and we talk about this, it's quantity over time. So how big was the spill? Uh, how long was it let go? And then what type of chemical was it? There's several factors there. Mm -hmm. It's never a good thing, obviously. There is, you know, we have very porous soil on Cape Cod. There's always the potential for contamination. And really that leads to investigation scientific, um, evidentiary, you know, supporting, you know, information about what exactly happened to that chemical, you know, where was it released and how quick was it, you know, mitigated. So it's, it's kind of a fuzzy answer. There's no, it's just, it's case by case, really. Right. But it's not a good thing. So how many facilities in Chatham are covered? 
I, um, I'd have to go back into the database and look, but I'm going to give you a ballpark of probably at least two dozen. Okay. I two think dozen to 30. Yeah. Judy, can you give the board members a copy of those covered facilities? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I can get, uh, first, I'll also get you a copy of Amy's presentation, and, um, and then I can get a copy from her of all the, possibly of all the facilities. So let's say we have 25 facilities that are currently filing these paper reports every, every year. Uh, how many of them have actually had a site visit? Oh, in Chatham, I did it years ago. Uh, I went to Riders Cove. I'd have to look at your list. Um, Riders Cove is wonderful, by the way. I would, mm. They're your model student, I would say, okay. for a private facility. They're fantastic. Um, you don't have bad compliance in Chatham. Everybody is a go-getter, and I, I won't tell you the bad towns. <laughs> there's really nobody. There's no bad towns. There's maybe young. I can honestly tell you, truthfully, less than five that I can think of that are kind of troublesome each year. But you you have very good compliance. You don't have a lot of issues out there. Site visits were done ages ago. I can always go back for educational purposes with fire or with public health. And we could even ask for a courtesy walkthrough like we do with Oyster Harbors for the Board of Health just to look at and visualize hands-on, what am I talking about? You know, we can always do that. We can always ask a facility. Um, I, I, I'm, maybe it's only interesting to me, you know, because I just think, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years and I still think it's the bee's knees. I just love it. It's really interesting to me and I'm very enthusiastic about it. But if some members of the Board of Health were like, you know what, I wouldn't mind walking through a place and really learning hands-on, I would, I would love to do that. I would love to facilitate that. Th thank you. Um, is it safe to say that if a fire call comes to the Chatham Fire Department and they dispatch a response, do they have the, uh, the ability on that vehicle to do a lookup for the, for the, uh, for the place they're yes. going to and immediately have a sense of what uh, volume and what type of hazardous materials may be in that facility? If it's a tier two facility and they have a report in the database, which is a online database, which makes it very easy. It didn't used to be that way. Um, yes, they do. It's um, And frankly, um, it just depends. Uh, Bourne had an issue with a water treatment plant. No, actually, that was a propane leak a couple months ago. And the deputy chief called me Thursday at 7 o'clock. And I said, what's happening? And he said, why are you asking that? And I said, because it's Thursday and it's 7 p.m. So I can, if they don't have access right away, I can look it up for them easily. But yes, if the tier two facility has a report on file, it's very simple for a first responder to look that up. The district hazmat team, district one is our hazmat team. They also have these records. So our multi-agency coordination center up at the county old jail where we're located, also has a copy. So there's many different agencies and entities. MEMA, Mass Emergency Management, has a copy. So it is pretty instantaneous to pull this information up. But on the same token, remember that last three letters, CRA of EPRA, Community Right to Know Act. So let's say one of your Board of Health members is like, I'm really curious, you know, I'd really like, like to go through the database. I'd like to see uh, such and such facilities report, I can send that to you. I can walk you through it and send that to you. Okay, thank you. I want to let mm -hmm. other board members ask questions now. Richard? Uh, it's very interesting that uh, Crosby Boatyard and uh, Oyster Harbors are like right next to one another and we're both very high class, uh, pristine kind of operations. Was there a compliance issue that led to the problem at at Crosby, or could the same thing yes. happen at Oyster Harbor? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> well, knowing what I know, I'm, I'm, I don't know for sure. Anything can happen, right? But knowing what I know about Oyster Harbors, I would be amazed if they had a compliance issue. Crosby had an issue when I came on board in 2004, and they were very, very, I should say, sensitive about it. And they did not want to let me really get too close to the information way back in 2004. This is way before I was doing this process, and I was just 
wanting to do a walkthrough for the town to enforce the town ordinance. They had just had all those issues in 2003, obviously, and they were still smarting from it. So it was understandable. And I was very new to the Cape and I, you know, just trying to work that relationship. And then by the time I left the town and, and, you know, moving forward into the reporting process, it, it hasn't been an issue, but boatyards, I mean, it just depends. And I don't want to, I'm, this is in no way, shape or form. This is no reflection on Crosby or Oyster or anybody you're dealing, you're juggling a lot of tasks as a marina and a boatyard. There's a lot to track. There's a lot of boats, chemicals, safety issues. There's a lot of public walking around. It's, it's amazing to me that our boatyards are so, you know, in charge and have a handle on their safety and their environmental protection. It, it, it really is. They're doing a stellar job. What happened with Crosby was probably a turning point and a learning experience. And it's, it's old news because we haven't had issues with them. And they, yes, they are neighbors. They, and Oyster was affected by that fire. I think they, they lost a building um, from that fire from Crosby. But we learn and we move on and then we gain uh, a better report with our uh, safety and compliance people, particularly at the town and the county. So it's good stuff today. Any other board members have a question? Um, ECRA, I remember ECRA from years ago, but I don't remember the P, I remember E-C-R-A. Was the P added in later? No, it's always been ECRA. It's Emergency always been Emergency Planning e Community Right to Know Act, yes. Okay. Yeah. And that law went into effect when? 1986. Wow. All right, thank you. Noble. Yeah, um, so, so, uh, who initiates a facility reporting? Are you gathering information on a, on a facility? Is it mandated that the facility report to you, or does the, do you or the community go out and find out which facilities might be at risk? Both, Dr. Hansen. Sometimes I drive by a place um, and I go, that looks interesting. Do they report? And I, maybe I'll look it up and I'll do some outreach. The outreach could be done by me. The outreach could be done by the fire department. And it's always come forward in an educational capacity. When a fire department, uh, particularly a chief calls and they say, hey, you know what, Amy, does, you know, ABC, you know, chemical report to you. I, they're having a little issue or wondering about this or that. Can you go check it out? So I will call the facility, explain the process and ease them into it. And nine times out of 10, the reaction is usually one of fear because hazmat, this is why I choose to be very proactive and education oriented and assisting them with compliance because hazmat is so far reaching and it's damaging effects to life, property and the environment that the immediate wave of, oh, who called you? I'm in trouble. And they picture big fines and, and terrible things. And that does happen. But I do my best, and I think my record and quantity or the number of facilities I have shows that dealing with them in a way that is educated, informative, and wanting to help them with good compliance and good environmental protection has been key in establishing those assessments. Whether I learned about the facility or the fire department or someone from the Board of Health asked about it or something to that effect. So the approach is always proactive. It's always trying to keep our businesses in business, trying to keep our town facilities below the radar. Our favorite expression is um, keep the EPA over the bridge. You know, we don't want the EPA coming over the bridge. We don't want to give them any reason. And I will tell you, and I'm very proud of this, that Len Wallace at the EPA has told me that he does very little enforcement in this area because he's told me I have a good handle on the region. I'm very proud of that. So. Um, I think the discussion on the board came up originally with uh, the single source aquifer and the zone two and a, a lot of businesses have come up in those areas, you know, um, over time. And is there, do you give special consideration to businesses that are directly on the, in the zone two or on the aquifer? Uh, well, I don't know what you mean by special consideration. Well, I mean, do, do, does anybody go through and like our commerce park? off 137, I think, is on the zone two. And there's Aries Pond is in there. There's body shops, mm -hmm. paint shops. 
things yeah. like that. Does, somebody, any, does anybody say, well, we might need to be concerned about this. Do we find get more information about that? Do you do that or? I've done a, um, it was, it's been several years and I can do it again. Um, I did assess Commerce Park and many of the people there were below thresholds to do reporting, but I had a lot of good conversations and outreach and introducing myself. Okay. So thresholds um, means the vol volumes of, of, of yep. fuel and diesel and that sort of thing? Yes. Because these the, are the, small operations, yeah. Yes, they're very small operations, but it still allows for the opportunity to educate and to have somebody who is in a compliance assistance role be able to be a contact and answer questions and help them. Um, I would focus on those areas again. If Judy and I have that conversation or follow up and the board wants us to take another look and do some walkthroughs and take another look all these years later, that's no problem. And it's just a conversation and you say, okay, you know, you can see there's, usually if people have 10,000 pounds or greater, you can see their storage, right? I mean, that's, you know, unless it's a water treatment plant or it's really enclosed, you can see a propane tank. You can see if it's a detail shop and they have 55 gallon drums and it's really adding up. It's very visual and you can talk to them about it. So it's not a, it's not a problem if you feel there's sensitive areas in Chatham and you want those reassessed these days because it's on the board's mind. Um, that's not a problem for Judy and I to follow up and have a sit down and say, okay, well, let's look at these and what area do we want to go to? And we have sensitive, um, you know, environmental places in Chatham and we want them reassessed. You know, that's part of the process. Dick, so uh, a fiberglass repair shop that has, say, six 55-gallon drums of resin for, make, for fiberglass, it's in a zone two that wouldn't trigger that the, the 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 rules aren't any different than if it weren't in some other were in some other zone in ter as far as you're it's concerned. Across the board, in terms of what you look at initially, is do they have ten thousand pounds or greater? Right. And then that list of lists would be deferred to. Um, sorry, I have I have two pups and they're waiting for their dad. So I'm I'm sorry if you hear them getting worked up. I apologize. Um, but that 10,000 pound threshold is what I would look at. I would look at the chemical, I would look at the weight of the chemical and then do the math and see if they were hitting a threshold. And then we would go from there. If they weren't hitting a threshold, okay, but I'd still have a conversation about safety, storage, um, anything that looked like they were disposing of something wrong. It would be a healthy conversation, an educational conversation. Amy, I've, I've got one more question. Are you aware of any town, any, Loca uh, lo um, local municipality that has adopted any kind of an ordinance through which they do regular visits, regular site visits? Arnstable, that's where I started as the hazardous materials specialist. Uh, that's why I mentioned their, their ordinance is replicated from APGRA, but it's a little more strict. Their threshold is uh, 110 pounds, Yarmouth also has an inspection process. It's the only two towns that have adopted a hazmat ordinance, uh, to my knowledge today, the only two towns. And they have the largest quantity of hazardous materials facilities. Dennis was talking about it. I met with their former director years ago with a template to try to implement a hazmat ordinance, but most towns don't. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's no, just one, one quick point. I, the common advice is for, for boaters to um, fill their fuel tanks when they're hauled for the season to keep um, water condensation out of the tank. So basically all the boats there have, have full tanks and you could easily have 400 gallons of fuel on, on a you know, medium sized boat. So Yeah, uh, boat yards are reporting in the thousands of gallons for diesel and gas. And then the boat yard itself, if they are selling fuel in the summer, they usually have tanks um, down by the docks. Right. The tanks are on land, they're reportable. So, and they, and, and if they do still doing battery storage, which a lot of boat yards are moving away from, they'll easily hit the reporting threshold for sulfuric acid. I will mention too that we have such good compliance on the Cape that a lot of boat yards report things voluntarily. So let's say they have only 200 pounds of sulfuric acid, they still report it for the benefit of the first responder. Interesting, okay, any more questions, comments? Amy, thank you very much for your, uh, giving us your time and your, your wonderful presentation. I feel, that I understand a lot better now 
what's going on in this uh, in this area than I did before. So, thank you. Good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Much. I'm, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And just reach out if you have any questions or you'd like to talk about anything as a follow-up. I'm I'm here to do that. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you very much uh, for that. Let's move to item number two on the agenda, an update and a discussion regarding Chatham water quality. Dr. Duncanson. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just quickly, um, three things, I just well, two things I just wanted to bring up to your attention today. Um, the warrant for the special town meeting has been finalized. Um, I believe that went out earlier this afternoon after I gave my final comments on the uh, the draft articles, there's basically going to be two articles at the upcoming special town meeting, which is on Saturday the 23rd, I believe it is. Um, uh, the first article, which is article number two, article number one is just cleaning up some prior year bills, as fr we frequently do. But article two um, is a request for $4.5 million to finish wells 10 and 11. I think we've talked about those two. Those are two wells. Uh, that are planned up in the Mill Pond area, up in the northwest corner of Chatham. And they are the result of a study that was done back in the 90s looking at other potential well sites in Chatham. That was identified as the, the best candidate. Uh, the well screens and casings were put in at that time, and then there was the detection of MTBE, and so things were kind of put on hold. Uh, the MTB naturally degrades over time, unlike PFOS, it will degrade. There are bacteria that, that eat it. Um, and so that has occurred as well as groundwater has moved any potential MTB away from that particular location. Um, so we're moving ahead with getting those two wells finished, recon finished construction, as well as a well house to support them with the chemical feed uh, materials and whatnot and get those two wells online as soon as possible, probably take about 18 months um, to get those online. So we're looking at probably the spring of 23 uh, before those wells would be finished and operational with the building. Um, and then the, the third article um, and the second one related to water is looking for $1.4 million. And that is to construct the, or to design, not construct, but to design the uh, treatment facilities for wells five and eight. Uh, if you recall in prior conversations, we've talked about the PFOS contamination in wells five and eight, both of which are now shut down. Well, five was shut down back in April. Well, eight was shut down in early September. So both of those wells are currently offline. Um, so we will design, in addition to PFOS removal, they both had there was already some engineering underway looking at iron and manganese in those wells. That Those are both naturally occurring compounds here on the Cape. They're part of the bedrock that underlies the entire area. Uh, but the levels of iron and manganese were getting to the point in both of those wells that they needed treatment. So they were starting to design that treatment facility. Along comes PFOS. Um, to effectively remove PFOS, you have to remove the iron and manganese first anyway. So we're now moving forward with requesting the engineering money to design uh, that facility. That's probably three years away uh, between the time it takes to design it, get DEP approval, and then construct it. If you remember, we took about two years um, to construct, or two and a half years to construct the water treatment plant down in the town forest area that uh, serves well six, seven, and nine. Um, and that's just iron and manganese. That does not include PFOS because there's no indication of PFOS um, in any of those wells. So that's one part of Article 3. The second part of Article 3 is to procure the granular activated carbon vessels. Those, so the big metal containers that hold the granular activated carbon that will re be used for the PFOS removal. Uh, we're going to go ahead and try to procure those as quickly as we can 
and at least get those wells online, hopefully by next April, next spring, um, for PFOS treatment on a temporary basis. And those vessels would be then incorporated into the larger building that will also house the iron and manganese. So it won't be like they'll be throwaway. We'll actually get them as soon as we can because right now, because of COVID and other things, there is a five to six month lead time um, from the manufacturer of those vessels just to get them. Um, so we're going to fast track the engineering and hopefully place the order for those vessels shortly after town meeting approval, get them in the queue for the manufacturer, and then get them here as quickly as we can uh, with the idea of having at least on a temporary base PFOS removal online by next spring before we get into another summer dry period. Uh, it wouldn't be enough capacity to treat both wells to their full ability, but hopefully treat enough of the water and get the PFOS removed that could then be blended with the remaining water to get the levels down extremely low. Um, so those are the two articles that will be on the upcoming special town meeting. And then the third component of the kind of the water quality picture was the study to re, uh, look at where the PFOS may have originated um, and try to identify a potential source. We've gotten three proposals in from consulting firms. We're reviewing those right now. Um, to fast track those, the town manager made the decision to take funding for that study uh, out of the consulting and engineering budget that's within her office. Uh, because it, it's a relatively modest amount. It's not a huge amount of money. Um, so we're hoping to fast track that and get that underway here shortly. Um, you know, the three proposals are all different. Um, some are a little bit more involved with testing and monitoring wells than the others are. So that's why we're taking a good close look at which one of those makes the most sense. But um, hopefully um, in the next week to 10 days or so, we'll make a decision as to uh, which direction that'll go. And then depending on which one it takes, um, it could take anywhere from a couple of months to the uh, the longest term one was about six months to get it completed. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. But hopefully by next spring, uh, we may have some information on source and, and identification. So that, any questions? Um, how much longer is the drought emergency gonna be in effect? Um, I actually looked at the drought monitor just before this meeting, and interestingly enough, it's only the Chatham, Lower Orleans, and, and Harwich area that is still listed in the lowest level of drought status um, on Cape Cod or in Massachusetts. Um, you know, we're getting rain this morning, tonight again, so I, I wouldn't be surprised that we see that changing. Um, you know, maybe not this week, but maybe next week when, the, okay. you know, the reports come out weekly or so. Um, but it all depends on what the state okay. decides to do as to whether or not they keep us. We're, we are in the lowest category of drought, if you will, mm. uh, which I think they call extremely dry. Um, so we'll see. I mean, it's definitely been getting better. That area has been shrinking quite a bit. All right. Uh, Thank over you. Over the last couple of months. Go uh, ahead. Just a quick question. Um, is there a way to get um, information about the importance of these articles and, and the money uh, uh, out to the residents so, so we'll have a quorum and, and they'll know, you know, be informed? Yes. The, as I said, the warrant went up on the website and all today. Um, I got an email earlier about doing some public education kind of thing, Channel 18 interview. Uh, we may try to put together quickly a frequently asked questions document. Um, honestly, I added some stuff into the explanations of the Warren articles because I was out last week when they were drafted. Um, I added some material into the explanations because I think it will help explain it to people and give them some more background to make it easier for them to understand why. Um, but yeah, we're gonna try to do some of those things to get a good turnout, first of all, um, and then a successful vote on both of the articles. Getting an article in the Chronicle would be very useful. I, I think the con now that the warrant is out, I think, I, well, I shouldn't think, I assume there will be. Okay. Yes. How many people do we need for a quorum? I believe it's 100. 100. Yeah. Is it going to be outdoors? It's going to be outdoors it rains again. every day now. Yep. <laughs> yep. It's going to be outdoors again. I think it's 930 on a Saturday morning. So 
Yeah, we looked at indoors, but given COVID and everything else, we weren't comfortable going there. And we don't want it too late in the afternoon because then it gets dark and it gets cool. And yeah. We tried to pick a time that wasn't going to interfere too much with Oktoberfest, which I think is the same weekend. So we settled uh -huh. at 9.30 or the, the selectmen settled at 9.30 and hopefully it won't take too long. Okay. You know, we'll see. All right, moving along. Uh, item three, an update and a discussion regarding COVID-19. Okay, so the latest COVID-19 numbers, uh, hot off the presses as of a little while ago. We currently have, and this is as of the end of September, uh, we have 396 cases in Chatham. We had 35 cases in September this year, so September of 21. We had 35 cases, and that's compared to eight cases in all of September of 2020. So we had almost four times as many cases this year um, as we did last year. If you remember last year, September, things were tailing off pretty well, um, and then we started into the Thanksgiving and Christmas spikes and whatnot. Um, of the 35 cases in September of this year, 19 are in vaccinated individuals, fully vaccinated individuals. Uh, six individuals are not vaccinated, and for 10 individuals, we don't know their status, um, either because they hadn't returned calls yet to the contact tracers, or you know, some people are just reluctant to provide information. Um, you know, the numbers have been going down. The first week in September, we had 12 cases. The second week, we had seven, nine cases the third week, um, and then five cases the fourth week, and in the last two days of the month, we had two cases. So, um, and that mirrors a trend, you know, nationwide. The cases are dropping. Um, you know, I think more and more people are getting vaccinated, which is a great thing. Um, in terms of our average daily, uh, well, the statewide 14-day percent positivity is 2.09%. Uh, the Barnstable County is 3.09%. In Chatham, ending on September 23rd, we were at 3.94. And then as of the 30th, so as of last 30, because this data comes out from the state once a week uh, we had dropped down to 3.41 so you know the trend is going in the right direction right. Um, at that point we were the fifth highest on the Cape remember probably a month ago I was touting the fact that Chatham had some of the lowest results in the Cape and then we had a little bit of spike um, but we are trending back down again and the same thing with our average daily incident rate um, on the 23rd, we were at 20.8, and on the 30th, it dropped down to 15.9. 15 so both of those indicators are going in the right direction. And keep in mind, you know, we've talked about this before, that data is always two weeks behind. So when it comes out on a Thursday, it's for two weeks prior to that Thursday. So, you know, we're, we're looking at percentages based on, you know, middle of, uh, middle to the third week or so in September right now, even though we're beyond that. So just something to keep in mind that things should be even better when this week's data comes out. Um, you know, in terms of age groupings, it's been pretty well, again, over the board, although, you know, we're seeing more cases in the younger demographics than, you know, a year ago when it was predominantly the older demographics. Uh, you know, we're seeing more cases in that 20, 30, 40 year old range, uh, which again mirrors what's going on nationally and whatnot. And, and you know, most of the cases, um, there's only been one hospitalization or one case that resulted in hospitalization out of the 35 in September. Most of the cases where people voluntarily provide that information to the contact tracers. Uh, their symptoms have been mild. Mm. You know, it hasn't resulted in, in hospitalizations or deaths, which, you know, continues to be what we're seeing. Um, so with that, I'll happy to answer any questions I can. Can I go ahead? Can I just ask you, since many 
people who are vaccinated are minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic, mm -hmm. what do you think the real incidence of COVID is? You know, the only people that are going in and getting tested are people that are symptomatic. So if we had 35 symptomatic people got tested, we may have had 100 uh, cases uh, uh, and many among vaccinated people who are asymptomatic mm -hmm. but still spewing virus and infecting other people. That's certainly possible. Um, uh, you know, there's no way to know what that percentage may be because they're not being tested. Right. Um, I do believe that there's a fairly high percentage of people getting tested that are not symptomatic uh, because they're getting tested for travel or other reasons. Um, we notice, you know, one thing you can notice in, in some of the reports um, where people have tested positive and, and, you know, the contact tracers ask, why did they get tested? Um, it's because they were traveling or going to visit relatives or whatever. So I don't think we're only testing symptomatic people. I think there is a fairly decent proportion of uh, people getting tested for other reasons. You know, exactly what percentage that is, there's, there's no way to know, you know. Ron? Right, but the, the concern would be last year, everybody that got COVID got symptomatic. Mm -hmm. And this year, they right. don't. So yeah. it may be more than four times as many cases. It may be eight times as many cases yeah, I mean, uh, this year. You know, obviously, you know, and, and you're right. And, you know, know, but again, there's just yeah. unfortunately no way to tell. Without right. testing every person, you know, there, there's no way to know those kind of percentage. Um, and that's why, you know, the recommendation is still just like here, you know, wear masks and, and whatnot. Right. I mean, I just got back from vacation. Wore the mask the whole time at the airport on the plane and, and the places we were visiting and all because that's, you know, that's the recommendations that they're following so that people can still, you know, go to these places but be safe, you know, so. The only way we'd have that answer is if somebody did a, uh, a zero survey of some type and, you know, mm -hmm. did a randomized sampling of every, uh, every 13th person that walks in the, st the stop and shop, you know, right. is, was right. tested in some right. randomized right. way as a grab sample, you could get an right. indication in that, but right. lots of luck doing but that. But these numbers are important because, you know, the reason we decided on the mask mandate was because we're having a lot of test positive people, and we still are, and yet now we're being, you know, there are requests to modify the mandate. And, uh, right. You know, and but I'm, I'm also surprised. I'm, I continue to be surprised at the high portion, high proportion of cases that are being uh, diagnosed in uh, vaccinated people. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was expecting that percentage to be really low. Right, and, and this and is one of the this is one of the concerns about the FDA and the CDC's approach to this. You know, they seem to only be concerned that vaccination prevents people from going in the hospital and dying, and they completely ignore the fact that a lot of vaccinated people are getting infected and spreading it to other people. And so, like in Israel, you know, one of the reasons they vaccinated everybody with a third with a booster dose is because they were able to raise antibodies and essentially eliminate test positivity and transmission. Right. But our uh, uh, people that are making these decisions uh, don't seem to think that vaccinated people testing positive and spreading is a very big problem. They only seem to think that if they get sick and die, it's a problem. So I, that's a concern. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'd totally agree with you. I think they're, you know, I think that's behind their mask recommendations for even vaccinated people to still wear a mask because they recognize and they've acknowledged, you know, for months now that vaccinated people can spread the virus. Hmm. And so the best way to prevent that is masks. Um, so, you know, I think in, in you know, in, in some respects, it makes a lot of sense. They're still um, you know, pushing unvaccinated people to get vaccinated. Right. 
A, to reduce the deaths, the severity of illness, the strain on the health care system and all. Um, you know, as of this afternoon, I heard that there were still 70 million eligible people in the United States who are not yet vaccinated. You know, and, and so you really hope you can reach those 70 million in some fashion. So, um, and then just one other thing I just wanted to touch on because um, the, the issue is broached. Uh, your current mask mandate, um, two weeks ago at the selections meeting when I updated them on your mask mandate, uh, there was some interest in asking you to consider for when the board of, at least when the board of selectmen and some of the smaller boards um, are meeting at the dais um, and people can spread out, you know, you guys probably aren't six feet apart, but some of the smaller boards like the board of selectmen where they may only have five people spread out across the dais, uh, there was some interest in would you consider um, reducing the mask requirement for people that are sitting up at the dais um, provided they are socially distanced, if you will. Um, and I said I'd be happy to bring that back to the board for you to talk about and consider whether or not, you know, you would consider changing your mask mandate that now requires masks completely um, for any meetings, public meetings held by the town. So to clarify, the request was to, to not to only have a waiver for the people running right. the meeting, assuming they were at least six feet apart. Right. Not for the general not, public. No, only for the sitting. people sitting up at the dais, provided they were vaccinated and sitting six feet apart. Yeah. Well, I'd like to hear comments. I don't know. What do people think? Well, I would oppose that. You know, I think that if we're going to have a mask mandate, uh, in public buildings, we have to have a mask, man mask mandate in public buildings. And if we make special cases for the Board of Selectmen or for some other board, that's going to create problems with other groups saying for the same reason, you know, if they're, uh, you know, uh, playing some game and, and they're staying apart, they shouldn't have to. Do. I think it would just create a, a whole can of worms. A and double, a, a and hopefully, double. hopefully within a month or two, we won't need to do this anymore if the, if the numbers are getting better. Additional board members. Ron? I'll agree with that because I think, you know, we'd want to spread out far enough so we could be six foot apart and we'd have, you know, all over this place. I think they have to stay with what we have there. We can't have two different tiers of uh, people being allowed to wear or not wear a mask. That's my feeling. Noble? Yeah, I mean, I think it gets close to uh, exempting ourselves almost. Um, but uh, I, I agree that uh, we have one un uniform policy. And when we make an order now, I mean, I, my next thought is, okay, what is going to be our criteria to, to go back to the guideline and remove that order? So. I'm thinking the numbers are coming down, so I'm close to thinking keep, it, keep the, our order as it is, but start thinking about when we can go back to the guideline. Um, and uh, the other thing is I, I've had people say in the community center, we want to uh, do things in the, in the gymnasium. I don't want to wear a mask. I've had people say, I, I want to go to the gym workout area in, at the community center but I don't want to go and, and wear a mask. So there, there's a pushback from people who are, who are saying it. So I would agree with what the other board member said, um, you know, keeping our order as is for the time being and thinking about when we will we'll resent it. Carol? I agree. I think we should stay with what we have. Single standard. Yeah. Same standard for everyone. Same with me. Same with you, Ed. Okay. Well, um, the board I, considered I, it I and think it's wor it worked out very well. Right. You know. And you you like consideration. Oh. Huh. Say that you agree. Just say. Yeah. Okay. Bob, you heard the discussion. I the board's not comfortable. Very good. <laughs> I got that, and we'll transmit it to the town manager and the board. Okay. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Could I ask Bob something? Uh, in this town, are people, some of the employees 
Closer required, to the mic. Uh, the employees required to get a shot, for example, the police, the fire, the emergency vehicles, are uh, they required? No. As of now, the town of Chatham does not have a requirement that people be vaccinated. Is there any reason why they haven't? Um, none that I'm aware of. Um, in the fire department, I know their vaccination rate has been extremely high. Um, I believe the same similar thing in the police department and among town employees, general town employees. Um, just on my anecdotal observations and contact with employees, um, the vaccine rate is, vaccination rate is fairly high. It's not 100%, yeah. uh, but it is fairly high. But no, as of now, we do not have any vaccine mandate. I, I see in so many other places they say they required 100%. Mm -hmm. Or uh, there's some, yeah. you know, punishment for it. And uh, yeah. I don't know why at all it would take it to be one person. You know, I mean, at I'm least glad at most least of them are. Those, at least those in the healthcare field. Yeah, the, the, mm -hmm. right. EMTs, which, and, key, which include the yeah. EMTs who were transporting people, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think you know something like that should be looked to. I don't know whether or not. It's our job to do it, or it's the Board of Selectmen? Um, I would say you could certainly raise that topic and make a recommendation. Um, I'm not sure, you know. I, I know from, a, from talking with counterparts in other towns um, where it has been mandated and whatnot, it turns into a union issue. Mm -hmm. It turns into a bargaining issue. Um, I'm aware of at least one town on the Cape that kind of went that direction, but in, in talking with some of their staff, they did a terrible job rolling it out, mm. um, and so it didn't go over really well. So, um, but I think, you know, if the board feels strongly about that issue, you could certainly make a recommendation to um, the board of selectmen and the town manager that at least be, you know, talked about at their level and reviewed. Does Cape Cod Healthcare have a mandated vaccination requirement for all their employees that have contact with patients? That is a fed, there is a federal requirement um, as well as a state requirement that any institution that's receiving Medicare reimbursement, Medicare or Medicaid, okay. um, that all their employees have to be vaccinated. I think it's maybe by November 1st or October sometime in October. Guess is why we're reading about it in big cities right. yeah. now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wouldn't the fire department, the paramedics and the EMTs, wouldn't they be considered health care providers and have to follow that federal mandate? Yeah, I, that's a question beyond my pay grade as to how they would be looked at in the reimbursement and whether or not it absolutely applies to them or not. I can certainly check. Well, they, they get reimbursement from yeah. Medicare for their ambulance runs. Yeah. So, yeah. yes. So, yeah. They're providing On the face of it, it would make sense, yes. Yeah. So, they should have to be vaccinated. Yeah. Anyone who works for the fire department. Bob, I, I could see if it's like the highway department, you know, the times that they come in contact with someone. Or some of those other ones, but definitely, you know, you look got to look at the police, the fire, the EMTs. Those are the ones that, you know, they're going to be responding right to the people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We want to think. Does board members want to think more about this and consider it in the future, or is there some willingness or eagerness to do something now tonight? I'd, I'd like to see us just everybody, other board members, because I've been thinking about it for a while because I think I mentioned to, to Judy at the last meeting, I kind of asked her, you know, and she says some of them are, and that's what really, you know, got me thinking about it. And I went home and I said, they're doing all these other types of things. I mean, airline, on airline employees, they have to either get in shots or they're off, you know. And I know the, the one, the big one with the state police was, you know, a, a thing that came down to negotiations. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to get money for the shot. You know, they wanted to take it to, you know, the union board. But I think there's something we should think about, at least for those people who are dealing with people, you know, sick people. Thank you. No, no. Um, I think it's something we could we could talk about again. But I think 
vaccine mandates is a big step. It's a big yes. thing, and it's it, it's difficult. And I see the numbers of cases coming down. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be thinking of, of that extra mandate when the numbers are coming down. If it was spiking up and there was a triggering event, then I think it would be a better discussion, my own opinion. What, Harold? What are the state guidelines? What is the governor mandating? Right. I don't know. Does the state have? I know they do for health care. They're following the federal. They have to enforce the federal. Yeah. But well, why don't we take this under advisement? I think, yeah. Board, I mean, I don't think we should. I'm not ready to vote yet either. But other I think than to, the fire department, we ought to, at some point, Judy and or Bob, we ought to at least find out what the what what's going on elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, on this area, I believe the state has mandated all executive branch employees. Um, again, by middle October or sometime mm -hmm. mid October November. Um, for all executive branch employees. And then there was the discussion with the state police about it being uh, mandated, and it went to court, and I think the judge ruled in favor of the state. Um, but we can certainly get you more detail for your next meeting. Okay. Maybe we could get some numbers regarding you know, what percentage of police and fire are vaccinated. Yeah, we can get you some rough numbers. In, in yeah. Chatham. Very good. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally wouldn't want to be taken to the hospital uh, by an EMT who is not vaccinated. Uh, I would concur with that because there's no reason. Right. There's no reason. Right. It's foolish. Yeah. Uh, before we thank you, Bob, okay. for that, that excellent report, I know there was one item that uh, Dick wanted to comment on regarding a, a, a rental dwelling. Um, did you want to raise that and ask? Well, you? no, I, I just found in my packet a, a certified letter from Judy yes. uh, to the Sandrew and Ann Keenan uh, saying that um, it has been uh, come to her attention uh, right. that they're advertising a six bedroom home uh, that can uh, accommodate 16 guests. <laughs> in a house that has a septic system approved for three bedrooms. And then there's evidence that they had construction work done to add an extra bedroom and bathroom on the second floor and additional bedrooms in the basement, right. which, were, which are illegal. Uh, and I would think that, you know, that it's good that she sent this certified letter and that uh, they should be forced to deconstruct uh, that house and bring it back into compliance. So they have to hire contractors to remove everything that was put in. We have, we, the, the owner of the property did come in to uh, the health department and talk to myself. Um, and he has been back and it's going, getting some building permits. I'm, I, I'm not sure of the details he was in today, and I'm going to be looking for some building permits from him. But um, I do know that this has been removed from from the uh, rental site as a six bedroom. It's been it, it was cited for six bedrooms as you know myvacation.com or whatever. Um, but they now, can't have their friends and relatives come either. Well, and, he, ru and run it as and have a six bedroom house. With a, with right. I mean, it's legally not a three, six bedroom house. It's legally a three bedroom. The basement um, does not have the proper egress and they're not legal bedrooms. That doesn't mean people aren't going to sleep there because we know that happens. But um, it certainly can't be advertised as a six bedroom house when oh. it's only a three bedroom. I thought um, they built a four bedroom on the second that, floor. That yes, the four, so the bedroom on the fourth uh, on the second floor is something that um, we we need to look at as well. Um, and there may need to. I did tell the owner that he needed to get an inspection from um, the health and building department. So good. We're on although, top of it. Although I suspect if one did a, a, um, a study looking at all the ads for rentals, you would see a pattern where the number of people that could sleep there would in many cases not jive with the number of bedrooms. It's true. I think that's, and, and we that's did a, bigger, a bigger question. And then you get into the debate 
of a septic system that's sized for, for, for three so bedrooms. How would it do for a, a rental season if there were eight people or 10 people there? Would it cope or would it not cope? And is the shortness of the season something that's forgiving? Or right. are we seeing failures during the We're summer? not seeing anything, but we this definitely spurred a discussion um, with myself and uh, um, Katie, Katie Donovan in the, the Community Development Department about, I mean, over the years we've talked about rental, rental um, registrations or bylaws, and, and this, we did talk about it again. Um, it's something that would have to be done, you know, with a, a new a couple of full-time staff people mm. and not necessarily health department. It could be community development, but it's something that we would need to look at again because I think this is a pretty common problem uh, in the town that people are renting these properties out as four, five, six bedrooms when they're re really yeah. legally only three bedrooms. Are there any uh, 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 town ordinances regarding how many people you can put into a three bedroom house? No. No, I mean, so they, so the, the, if they, if they didn't have a fourth bedroom and they didn't have bedrooms in the basement, if they just wanted to put bunk beds in the basement, they could put 16 people in a three-bedroom house legally. There's state regulations, the housing code that that allows um, occupancy depending on square footage of the property. So, but that's, as you can imagine, it's very hard to enforce on a rental type situation that's short term. Um, so well, I go, but you could search. You could do a search for rentals in Chatham and see what what people are advertising. Oh, well, sure. And if they're advertising a, a twelve, you know, accommodates twelve people in a, a house that has really three, the best three way bedrooms, then they should be prohibited from doing that. Yeah, the best way to deal with that would be to do some type of a rental registration where they are required to. Yeah give us the you know number of bedrooms and the size of the rooms and then we calculate how many people they're allowed to have there but again that's not something we can do with our current you know staff right in any of our departments so it's, it's something we've talked about off and on over the years um, and this this came up and and it's starting to be you know with the last couple of years with covid and people coming to town and renting their property or staying for longer um, it seems to be more of an issue. Ron. We took a, a real look into that because mm -hmm. I remember, I know it must have been on the board too at the same time. And it came down to, you know, money. Basically, they didn't want to put on any extra staff at the time. But the, it would only have to be a part timer. I mean, during the summer season, they don't have to have someone on for a yearly season. And uh, we looked at, like, Dennis, I think it was the other town mm -hmm. that we looked at, yeah. and Provincetown maybe. I can't remember There's what they were. There's a few towns that have it. Yeah. I mean, you, I remember that. You would need a full time, at least one full time administrative assistant and a, and a part time inspector minimum to do this right. and do it properly. Is that the way the other towns do it? Sure. I, I yeah. worked in Dennis. They had they had, I think, three secretaries and uh, on you know I mean, it's a much larger town, but that their rental program is is a part is a big part of the health department and so do the people um, to the people who want to rent their place out they have to f put in an application to the board of health then mm -hmm. they, they, they put in the an application then there's an inspection fee. for fire safety you know mm -hmm. for all yeah, those life safety kind of issues mm -hmm. um, and then they basically get issued a certificate some are good for a year some of the towns are good for longer periods of time um, because a lot of a lot of this it, it is a year-round issue because a lot of the rentals take place in the wintertime and all. Year People round. are renting, you know, for the summer, but a lot of the transactions take place in the winter. Hmm. So you want to make sure you catch it during that period of time so you don't get the three-bedroom house being rented out to 12 people, you know, kind of thing. You can't just, you can't just wait and in the summer respond to complaints. You need to be proactive and go after, you know, those kind right. of situations. So I mean, this one was so flagrant because of what they posted online, you know, it was kind of obvious. Right. But, you know, a lot of people don't post online like that. And, you know, so we may not have a way of hearing about it. Well, there was the incident of the bus that yeah. they were renting yeah. that didn't even have bathroom facilities. <laughs> right. Somebody was renting a bus? Yeah. <laughs> We, uh, that's it been, was the bay. That's been rectified. On, yeah, <laughs> on Joshua Jethro, and they were using it as a separate 
thought it was a fun bus that they do. Well, it was, a, it was a, basically no, no, a separate was... dwelling unit. It was advertised on Airbnb. It had a kitchen, beds. It was a camper bus. Port, they yeah. had porta potty for the bathroom, but he, he was burnt. And he, they were served a notice. I don't know what's happened finally, but yeah, I, I, one question I have. So done. You, yeah. you failed the septic system on this um, Sam Ryder Road property. Could, could, could the party bus, I call it the party bus on Joshua Jethro, have been dealt with by failing their septic system? That would have really triggered action. Well, they didn't have a septic system. It was, a, uh, it was a basically potty, a camper. Right? Yeah. It's basically yeah. a camper. So yeah. Yeah, that was dealt by zoning. Um, dealt with through zoning. A multicolored bus, two, right? Parked yes. in the side of the two, house. Two yeah. dwellings yeah. on one, on a single. So this is something line. we can put on an agenda. I mean, it's not really on our agenda today. So right. um, I definitely could bring it up in um, uh, at another meeting, and we could talk uh, more about how, you know, okay. the possibilities of. I just think if other towns have done it, it must be successful in that town. I mean, I know Dennis. You know, put it in, and it was successful. All solid Provincetown. Dennis did it in the '70s when they had a lot of people renting properties, summer kids, and there were a lot of parties. Well, it was more of a way to control that. Um, so they've been right. doing it literally since the '70s. Well, we have a lot but of people. You know, I know, and when we've town. talked about it in the past, it's been we haven't gone there because we didn't feel like we had a, a big problem with um, rentals being uh, a problem right. as far as people. I, no. I hate to, I can remember, I can't remember what her name was, though. She brought in a stack of uh, advertisements that people had advertised. It was like a two-bedroom house, and they were advertising for so many. I can't remember who that was that brought it in that got us going on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I... I but Judy, what Judy says is true. Back then, if I recall, we looked into this, and at the mm -hmm. end of the day, we said, well, how many instances can we point to of of real problems with uh, you know police reports mm -hmm. and 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 too many people making noise and disrupting a, a neighborhood complaints violations complaint violations right. or and or any evidence of midsummer or late summer septic failures induced by no, homes that, that were excessively uh, occupied and we didn't have any of those either. That no, we not that I can see, but this is a different, I think what we're seeing now is this, you know, overuse of properties yeah. uh, based on this whole Airbnb, you know, format. So, okay. um, and I don't think it's just a, a health department issue. It's community development and, and health and, okay. you know, water usage issue because these, these properties are getting overused. So. The other uh, related thing that, that has come up is... Um, the criteria for what is considered a bedroom with these all these new home plans we're seeing, uh, mm -hmm. because as I, I gather that it's not written right. in black and white. And are, are well, those local regulations or are they state those rules? I, I've heard that different towns have different rules about what's considered a bedroom. There's a combination of rules. There's there's the building code, which has their own requirements for habitable spaces and rooms that you can use for sleeping purposes. Um, there's the housing code, which is a state sanitary code, which is what I would use. Um, we don't have a definition from the Board of Health. That's something I, I we've talked about recently. You know, the, the size of the opening, the five foot. Yeah, I mean, it's just something that could come or up a in sun that room same discussion. Or, right? So that's something I think I could bring back to you with a with a real definition that we could adopt we'll for see, a bedroom. You know, the, I think mm -hmm. we should the do exercise that. room. Yeah. The, well, that's so something we can definitely do. So all of these topics I will put on future agendas and we can we can move forward with them and, and discuss them. Definitely. I'm right. sure a lot of people who own a house down here that they rent out would be very happy if the town did something like that with them. Some would, some wouldn't. It would be, <laughs> they'd be <laughs> protecting yeah. their town. Right. Their some wouldn't, some wouldn't. Yeah. 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 Can I just um, announce the flu clinic? <laughs> Ooh. John? Yes. Judy, um, do so. So I just wanted to let everyone know that the flu clinic registration is uh, up and live online. Um, the clinic is going to be um, October 19th at the Chatham DPW from, nine, from 1030 to 1230. It's a drive-through clinic. And um, the, the DPW is at 2... 21 Kroll Road in Chatham. The registration is, is online, um, and the website to register is chathamfluclinic.timetap.com. 
that link is on the Board of Health's website right. and okay. the and the uh, Health Division's website. Anybody can call the Health Department or the Council on Aging if they need assistance in registering. We can help them do that. The poster doesn't have the address of the I, Yes, I'm sorry about that. I yeah. did change that, so I'll send oh, you an okay. updated poster. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. Yeah, Mandy from COA brought that to my attention right away, and I'm, I didn't forward the revised one to you, but um, it is going to be at the DPW building. Will they have both senior? It will have high dose, the high dose and the low dose available. Mm -hmm. And when you register, you can pick which one you want. Gotcha. So. All right. All right, we have a little bit more business to do before we adjourn. Did we have? I just one quick little uh, business thing. Um, a real quick follow-up on where, where the McGrath property stands. Is it still with the legal advice and, and getting a game plan going? I just think we need to we, yeah. move along. Yeah, we're still trying to push that along. Um, I've been in contact with a couple of surveyors about getting a survey done for the road layout so we know exactly where that is. Uh, some surveyors are reluctant to touch it because of the individuals involved. Um, and the other surveyors, as you guys know, they're all just straight out with so much business that, you know, you can't get stuff done as quickly as you would hope. Um, but I am waiting right now. I talked to a couple surveyors before I went on vacation. I'm just waiting for them to send proposals over, um, you know, how much and how quickly they can get it done. Um, you know, some concerns been expressed about, well, you know, we can put stakes out there and they're probably going to disappear in 30 seconds. And I said, well, we'll just have to deal with that. We may have somebody out there um, as you're staking it, taking photographs and measurements and whatnot. So we know with, uh, by other means, because our expectations are the stakes are not going to last. Can we uh, get GPS coordinates for each marker? We can, yes. And how accurate uh, would they yeah. be? Um, it depends. Most of the surveyors now are accurate within inches. Okay. So I think we can we can do it that way. Um, I did forward an email um, that came in this afternoon or earlier today um, over to the police department uh, because the person had inquired about a number of unregistered vehicles on the property and all. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted them to be aware of that as well. But you know, all those things are going to be addressed um, as quickly as we can within the guidelines that town council has said. You know, in terms of crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's, recognizing that more than likely this will end up in some kind of legal action at some point, so. Right. Yeah. All right, can I, I'd like to get the minutes approved for the September 13th meeting and for the se September 20th meeting. Do any board members, let's take the 13th first. Any board members have any edits, corrections that you want to, make on the draft minutes for September 13th. If not, can I have a motion to accept? Motion to accept, no. Can I get a second? Oh. Okay, Ed, yeah. say uh, it again, Ed. Uh, yeah. Motion uh, to accept. The uh, September 13th. Okay, can I get a second? Ron, okay, all in favor of adopting Accepting the minutes of September 13th, 2021, say aye. 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 All right, that motion carries. Now we have the meeting summary or minutes for September 20th. Again, any edits or corrections? Anybody feels uh, are needed? If not, can I have a motion to accept these minutes? Uh, motion to accept uh, the minutes of September 20th. Okay, can I get a second? Second. Carol. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, those minutes are approved. Are we ready to adjourn? Can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Ed, good. I'll second. Carol, second. All in favor of adjournment say aye. 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 Okay, thank you everyone.